Welcome to the Legal Academy, Episode 5. I'm your host, Oren Kerr. Uh, my guest this week is Eric Posner, the Kirkland and Ellis Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, Eric is one of the most productive and most cited professors in the Legal Academy. He's written over a dozen books, uh, over 200 law review articles on diverse topics, including law and economics, international law, um, constitutional law, and other, other fields. Uh, he started teaching as a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in 1993, uh, but now has been at the University of Chicago since 1998. Uh, uh, and he has visited some other places, but otherwise has been in Chicago for the last 22 years. Uh, Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks, Soren. Nice talking to you. Yeah, great to talk to you too. So I, wa I wanted to start with scholarship. You write in a, a diverse set of fields. As I mentioned, there's con law, there's international law, um, uh, law and economics, obviously, uh, contract law. When, when you see yourself writing in these different fields, do you see it as all kind of the same project? Are you bringing kind of one mindset to all of them? Or when you see yourself working on topics in different fields, do you see yourself as doing like a fundamentally different kind of project? I think uh, I do different things in, in different fields. Um, some of the things I write about in some fields, it's just economics. Um, uh, I, I suppose to some extent, everything I write is influenced a little bit by uh, maybe rational choice theory and um, maybe a kind of skepticism for received wisdom. Uh, but uh, I think each field has a different, you know, kind of logic and feel to it. And, and I, I write differently in each field. And I've, I've noticed that you, first, you often co-author articles. In fact, the great majority of your recent articles have been co-authored. Uh, not only co-authored, but co-authored with a wide range of different co-authors. Uh, many on the Chicago faculty, uh, but others not on the Chicago faculty. How did that come to be and why why co-author pieces instead of solo author well i turned that question around to you which is you know why, why does anybody engage in solo authorship I don't, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense and, and if you look at you know most social science fields certainly and even you know increasingly fields like philosophy there's a lot of co-authorship um, co-authorship makes a huge amount of sense because people with maybe different backgrounds in some cases or um, different ways of looking at things come together and, and write something that's better than either person could write alone. Um, when I co-author with economists, you know, I'm taking advantage of their expertise in economics, which I lack in most cases. Sometimes I've written with uh, constitutional law professors who know a lot more about constitutional law than I do. And in all of these cases, I bring something. I, you know, I may have um, some perspective on the topic, which the other person, you know, may agree with, but not have the the tools to um, to to to, to um, write about it uh, independently. Um, and so I try to co-author every paper I write. I prefer co-authoring. And if I write alone, it's only because I can't find somebody who agrees with me or has the time or you know the inclination to, to join with me. So so. Is co-authoring kind of linked to the breadth of areas that you write in and that because you can pick a co-author in different areas, you can kind of enter different areas where a certain amount of expertise is required that you may not yourself immediately have? Is, are those two ideas linked in your mind? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I put it a little bit differently. I mean, even if I only wrote in one field, I would try to co-author because even a single field is complicated and you can always benefit from uh, working with somebody else. But if there was some law against co-authorship, then there's no way I would have written in as many fields as I've written, because I just can't learn enough to, to start writing. Let's say constitutional law is an example. I, well, I first started writing in about constitutional law years ago with various co-authors. I didn't know enough to write about it myself, um, and I never would have taken the trouble to try to master the field enough on my own to start writing. Um, now, if you co-author with somebody in a different field long enough, you'll pick it up a bit. And so, you know, at some point, um, I, I could write alone, but I never want to. Um, and so really, it's just a question of whether there's someone out there who I know well enough. Now, it isn't easy to find co-authors because you really need somebody who 
both um, knows something different from what you know, but basically has a very similar worldview to yours. And there are not that many people like that, not for me anyway, not in the legal academy. Um, and, uh, and this is even harder when you look for people in different disciplines. So if I co-author with an economist, often they're just not interested in a lot of areas that law professors care about. I'm not so interested in things care, they care about. So often, you know, the circumstances have to be quite special for the co-authorship to work. I, I want to add, by the way, that, you know, um, since, since you're, you know, your audience here is at least partly junior professors, I do know that um, some people, when they're starting out, don't co-author. They might be warned by a secret senior faculty member that uh, you know if you co-author, then when you're up for tenure, people can't tell what how much you did and all that. Well, my view is the opposite. You know, I, I give credit to people who co-author. Um, when we're looking at people to hire and when we're tenuring people, if someone has co-authored a lot, I think that's good, not bad. I give that person the benefit of the doubt, um, especially if the person has repeatedly co-authored with either the same person or, or other or good people in general, because that usually means the person is is pulling his or her her weight. You, since you since people tend to write better articles when they work together with other people, you want to encourage it, not discourage it. Now there are of course um, people on faculties, especially very senior people who uh, do discourage co-authorship, at least, you know, up until tenure. Uh, there are people like that. I think they're in a dwindling minority and, and their views don't make much sense. So I, I'm wondering how much of this reflects the culture at the University of Chicago, which has uh, always struck me as having kind of a somewhat distinctive academic culture uh, where a lot of faculty members are co-authoring with each other. Uh, and there's also a kind of a culture of firing out a lot of law review articles, right? So that's sort of, maybe this is a stereotype of Chicago, and I'm interested if you think this is accurate or not, but the mm -hmm. kind of stereotype is a lot of people writing a lot of articles, maybe in areas that they're not the expert in, but nonetheless, they are, you know, writing a lot to see what works, whereas at other schools, and I've sort of thought of this as like the Harvard model of spending, the, you know, they may spend years writing the, the opus, right? The magnum opus, like major... Mm -hmm article uh, uh, that is like the statement. Do you have do you have thoughts on, well, first I'm interested to you know if you think this stereotype is true about how the right. University of Chicago works, but also like, is it better to think, you know, is it better in general to the extent you can say, firing out a lot of, lar a lot of articles of which any one might maybe not be such a great one. There may be one that's a little substandard or waiting and sort of making the statements kind of the major statements. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm a little wary of these sorts of uh, um, generalizations. Uh, you know, Chicago has changed a lot over, as long as I've been there. And these, these were always a little bit, I think, cliches, sometimes based on prominent people at different law schools, selection effects, I suppose, rather than, you know, what's actually going on. Okay, so, but there, there are a few questions embedded there. Let, let me just quickly, first on co-authorship, as far as I can tell, the overwhelming majority of people in at least the top law schools, they're all co-authoring. They're co-authoring at Harvard, they're co-authoring at Yale, Berkeley, you know, everywhere. There's a lot of co-authoring going on and in not just law and economics, but lots of areas. This is the trend, it's gonna continue. Uh, you just look at economics or at the social sciences, everybody co-authors with everybody else. You know, in, e in economics, even, you know, student, uh, PhD students, they're co-authoring with professors and with other PhD students it just doesn't make sense uh, to avoid co-authoring. Okay, but on to your, your, your other point, your other question. Um, I don't, you know, I think, there, I think it's roughly true that at Chicago, you know, there's a kind of a sense that very long papers are a waste of time and are not a good thing to, to do as a general matter. Now that's a little bit different from what you asked, which is whether it's okay to, write bad papers, <laughs> you know. I don't think we think it's okay to write bad papers. Um, uh, I do think, okay, so long versus short. Long papers are, tend to be a waste of time. Long law review articles are a waste. Um, you know, usually they're so long because there's a kind of a survey article embedded in a, another article that's trying to make a, paint, a point. And I've lost track of the number of times where I've, you know, 
read a, a draft by a junior professor and I say to that person, I really think you should get to your thesis before page 44. You know, it's just, <laughs> it, the reader just has to skip over all that stuff. I mean, not the law review students who are reviewing the article, you know, the submission, and that's what's driving all this, but actually the people who matter, the, the um, other people in your field, you're right. just wasting their time. Um, so long versus short, now some articles should be long, but you know, as a generalization, short is better. Um, in terms of quality, I don't know. I, you know, I think the, the cliche that I've kind of inherited from maybe the 1990s or something like that is that at a place like Harvard, um, junior professors either are encouraged to or somehow get the sense that they should write, you know, one or two really long articles that, uh, I don't know, are perfect, you know, that make no mistakes and have a million citations and, um, but of course these articles, you know, great articles aren't, you don't write a great article just by making it long and avoiding typos and miscitations. You have to actually say something new. So you have these long tedious articles that don't have a, a make a huge impact, but you know, is that just Harvard? I mean, I think there's some people who do that in all law schools. And that's true about junior professors and more senior uh, professors uh, as well. Um, I think um, in all fields, there are articles that you might call kind of high risk, high return articles. Those aren't bad articles. They're adventurous and, and maybe speculative. Um, and maybe that's what you're talking about. If that's true about Chicago, that's great. Uh, people should write articles like that um, uh, in all fields, you know rather than being really safe and boring. Um, but, you know, if you, if you write something and you, you present it at some workshops and you, and, you know, you, get, you, you, you um, um, ask people for comments and everybody says that's kind of mediocre, you should probably just not publish it, <laughs> regardless of what law school you're at. Right. Do, do you have advice for, especially for junior scholars, but, but, but more broadly, on how to think about uh, symposium articles, which, you know, typically are short and that maybe the symposium, they want to cabin sort of the topic on which you might write. Uh, and a lot of scholars struggle with how often to write symposium articles. Uh, and, and I'm curious if you have thoughts on how to think about that decision of whether to, whether to accept the symposium or, or not. Just if, you know, it's useful, you know, if, if you have an idea that uh, could be a symposium article. Maybe it's a small idea for a small article and the conference is otherwise useful for you because you'll meet people who are important for your interests and career and you'll exchange ideas with them. And, and you know, that could all be worth it. You know, you wanna take into account the whole package of, um, of attributes, you know, uh, who else is gonna be at this conference, assuming that it's, it's an in-person conference um, are you going to learn from them? Are you going to be able to maybe find some co-authors there? That would always be a good thing. And then, you know, either there are people who I've seen who've gone to conference after conference after conference, summarizing their earlier work and repeating it. I, I would avoid that. That's just a waste of time. Um, uh, but if you can think of something new to say that is, uh, you know, where you're advancing your ideas, or uh, forcing yourself to learn something new, then it, then it may well be worthwhile. Do, you, you've written many articles that have been ended up in peer edited journals and many articles that have ended up in student edited law reviews. When you think through which you plan on submitting for a particular article, do you have a framework for which goes where, or is it just which one students will understand? Is, is, <laughs> is, do you have a strategy for which you submit to? Well, you know, you, 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 when you write an article, um, you either orient it toward a peer reviewed publication or a law review publication. So you, you make the decision before you write the article usually, or at least early in the process. And um, I guess my own sense is that, you know, most of my articles are not that appropriate for peer reviewed article, peer reviewed publications. But sometimes I do empirical work, work with co-authors, for example, I would never write an empirical article for a law review. I think that's a complete mismatch. 
law review students can't evaluate empirical articles. And when I see empirical articles in law reviews, I never know whether to trust them. So if it's an, if it's an empirical article with, you know, colleagues, you know, it's going to be written for a peer reviewed journal and it'll be sent to peer reviewed journals. And if it's rejected, it'll be sent to some other peer reviewed journal and so forth. Um, I've recently begun writing an antitrust and there are a couple antitrust peer reviewed journals and I've just decided I'd much rather um, publish in those. There's one called Antitrust Law Journal, for example. You just get all this feedback from experts. It's incredibly helpful. Um, you know, if I, so, you know, generally speaking, I, I'll prefer a peer reviewed article for a peer reviewed journal for an antitrust uh, article. Um, in other cases, let's say an international law article, it probably doesn't matter that much one way or the other. There is some, there are peer reviewed art, uh, journals like the American Journal of International Law. You can probably write a somewhat shorter article for them, uh, which is good, uh, but it may get less attention. Uh, you know, the trade-off is always that if you, if you there's always a concern that um, a, peer, a peer reviewed article will just get lost somehow. People won't see it. And at least the top, say, 10 to 20 law review articles, that's less likely to happen. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about that when I, when I write, thing, write things as well. But I think the bottom line is for a lot of work that I do and other people do, you know, the peer reviewed journals aren't really that appropriate for them because they tend to write more, they publish more technical stuff, especially in law and economics. And, um, uh, uh, and, then, or, and then there's always, the, again, this worry. And, and so some of them are interdisciplinary. So, you know, you may be trying to find another audience outside of law schools. But if you're not, if you just have a law, a law school audience, then a law review article is probably better. A law review journal is probably better. A law review is probably better. It, it, and, it's late uh, in the day. Uh, Obviously, many criticisms have been made about student edited law reviews and, you know, there's a, an enormous scholarship often published in student edited law reviews about how bad student edited law reviews are. Do, do you share those criticisms or do you think they're sort of adequate, at least for your purposes, when you're, especially when you're thinking of peer reviewed versus student edited, is the quality of the process and the quality of the output going to make a difference to your choice, or is it more just audience and fit? Well, law review, law reviews are not good. You know, the system is not good. Law reviews don't do, law review editors don't do a good job of uh, evaluating work. They, they don't do a good job of giving feedback. You know, they'll get, you know, they are, they're not terrible. They will, you know, editors will tell you, if, you know, what you're saying. They can understand what you're saying. If they can't understand it, it's probably not good. But I've published dozens of articles with peer review. There's no comparison. I mean, everybody knows this. Peer reviewed journals, and I've edit, I edited a peer review, uh, a, a peer reviewed journal for about a decade, the Journal of Legal Studies. So I've seen this from both sides. It, it, your article is sent to ex, is an, an expert or a group of experts. And they will give you, unless, you know, they'll, they'll sometimes take a long time. Sometimes they'll do a bad job because they're lazy or they're distracted. But most of the time you get superb feedback. Um, they'll tell you, you know, the literature that you've missed. Um, they'll tell you, no, your article's not as original as you say it is. You should cite Oren Kerr, for example, who said this before you did. They'll say there's a mistake in this regression. They'll say, you know, it's just, there's just no different. There's no comparison. Um, the, uh, I, th I think one overlooked um, <laughs> problem with law reviews also is that they exploit students. Uh, this is largely a waste of the time of the students. Uh, they're basically doing unpaid labor. Uh, they're basically at best research assistants who spend a lot of time correcting citations or, and, and they shouldn't be doing that. You know, it's the, the, the system is, is a little bit corrupt. Uh, law review shouldn't be giving credit to, to uh, law review students. Um, my favorite topic right now is labor monopsony. And basically, if you're paying somebody nothing to do a lot of work, um, it's because you have a labor monopsony and you can, and the law, the law schools do. So it's, it's a bit of a shame. Uh, the system, though, does seem to be highly entrenched. So I'm not sure whether there's any point in fulminating against it. Yeah, some some professors have talked about forming new peer edited journals in different subject areas, especially, obviously there are many in fields that are related to PhD disciplines, but you know, there's no 
you know, journal of Fourth Amendment law. There's no journal of, you know, sort of specific doctrinal areas, much like there would be in, in other areas in, in, in like the sciences. I mean, is well, that... there are. I mean, there are, just nobody knows about them. I mean, Harvard started a few years ago the Journal of Legal Analysis, which is intended to be a kind of a general peer-reviewed journal. I think they've had a lot of trouble attracting good papers. I've published a couple of things there. And, it, you know, it's just, I don't know. The, the, the law reviews are entrenched. And so stuff I've published there is no better or worse than stuff I've published in law reviews. But, it, it you know, it does seem to be much more likely that work will be overlooked um, if it's published in a place like that. Um, uh, so uh, there, and then the antitrust, you know, the antitrust law journal is a general interest. I think they're they're a little bit better uh, at getting work out. How I don't know, maybe it's just better known to the to the community. Okay, I wanted to turn to to faculty hiring questions. Uh, so schools in general try to have a little bit of everything sort of uh, most schools I think don't have a very specific scholarly culture or something distinctive there's a lot of similarities I think school to school at least that's been my my experience and Chicago stands out as a school that I think is different in that it does have kind of a much more uh, cohesive uh, sort of style and and scholarly environment um do you think the the sort of the Chicago approach in that regard is the right is, is sort of should all other schools try to do that too? have like a particular kind of style or particular focus or is the generalist view sort of a little bit of everything okay and what 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 motivates me in asking this question is one one dynamic i've touched on in these ser series from time to time is how professors from different fields within a law school so often have little idea of what their colleagues are doing uh, so one professor from the school might present a paper and of the 30 people that show up at the talk, you know, two or three really follow what's going on. A few more roughly follow it and many are completely clueless about mm. what's, what's happening. Um, mm. Is that just inevitable that that's going to happen in a law school that 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 we're just it's just a it's, it's just a community of people doing so many different things that for some reason have the same tent or are there ways of 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 bringing a school together either methodologically or in some cultural way to kind of make it more of an entity i think it's probably inevitable and i think it'll happen to chicago eventually as well uh, the so here i think the main secret of chicago's success hardly a secret is that the faculty is small but the faculty has been growing and will probably grow more i think there are basic you know economic reasons why Law school faculties tend to be large, and law schools tend to be large. The larger the faculty, the harder it is for people to know each other, even if they want to, you know, and to keep track of each other's work. Um, so I think, uh, uh, you know, we have various institutions and practices that tend to reinforce the culture. They'll be harder to maintain if the law school gets very large. Um, and then meanwhile, uh, there's specialization, and, and specialization is very natural, um, um, natural development in all fields. Um, the law school, legal scholarship has become much more specialized. A lot of the specialization has been going on in the last, say, 20 years, maybe 30 years. I mean, it starts 40 years ago, but it really, you know, in, in all the different sort of methodological approaches to law, they're, they're a lot more sophisticated than they used to be. So it's harder for people outside of these fields to understand what's going on. So if you take economics, for example, you know, economics in the 19, law and economics in the 1970s and 1980s, you know, it was a lot, very common sense. There was a little bit of math that was very simple. You know, anybody could kind of pick it up. Economics now is not, it's just not like that. I mean, people still do that type of law and economics. But um, uh, as I was saying, I've gotten interested in antitrust. And I've been going to conferences and learning a little bit about it, but it's just massively complicated. It's massively complicated with an economics and, you know, the, the antitrust uh, legal scholars, you know, they keep up with this, but, you know, they can't really master and understand this and at the same time spend a lot of time reading a work, uh, work outside of antitrust. The growth of empirical scholarship is another example. So, um, you know, I think the most exciting development in legal scholarship is empirical work going back 20 years now or so. 
this is really important, but empirical methods are complicated and they're constantly developing and becoming more complicated. And the people that you want on your law school, you want them to do good empirical work. You want them to do good, you know, cutting edge empirical work, not the sort of empirical work that passed muster 30 years ago. Well, these guys, the sort of people who are interested in this, like they're interested in, uh, you know, the latest machine learning techniques and coding, you know, all this stuff and they have to specialize in it and they get interested in it and they want to talk to other people about it and they don't really want to talk to you know someone about tort law or the latest supreme court case and that's good you know i mean that's what you want you want good scholarship and and um and good scholarship means specialization um so i think law schools will increasingly become like business schools i, I suppose some law schools or maybe even most law schools are already like that but for example, if you compare the, the, the law school at Chicago with the business school at Chicago, the business school is fragmented. You know, the, they're, they're different areas within the business school. They're the economists, they're social psychologists, I guess cognitive psychologists, social psychologists, historians. And, you know, they tend to talk to each other in little groups. Um, and to some extent that's been going on in, in law schools for a long time now, it'll continue to happen. Um, so, you know, you can, you know, at Chicago, if we want to maintain our culture, you know, we could try to uh, select people or give weight to people who apply for positions who have broad interests and who, you know, like to think about lots of different fields. And I, you know, we do that to some extent, I suppose. There's some people on the faculty who think that's more important than others, maybe. But I, I just don't think you can maintain a, um, a, uh, a faculty with the top, you know, with the best people, people doing the best uh, work if they're not specializing. And uh, so I think that's sad, but, but I think more or less inevitable. And so taking that inevitable trend sort of to where it's, to, to its destination, is that, are we just gonna be in a world where you, even less than you do now, can you really can't follow what other people at your own law school are doing, and if that's true, how does that, how, how do you do faculty hiring in a world where you really have no idea what many of the candidates coming through are talking about? I think what happens um, um, just sort of naturally is that increasingly the bulk of the faculty will give deference to the small number of people who are in the field of the applicant who's being considered. Uh, not complete deference, but basically, you know, um, if we have two historians on our faculty and we're considering another historian, you know, the opinions of those two historians are going to get a lot of weight, maybe not decisive weight. Um, and, and, and I think that'll, that's, I think that's always been true to some extent. I just think that the level of deference will, will increase. And it could be formalized. I don't know how things work in business schools, but you can easily imagine if the law school's faculty is large enough that you just have, you know, different groups within the faculty who basically select, you know, the, 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 the faculty as a whole or the dean say, do we need, a, you know, another historian? Do we need another philosopher? And once that decision is made, then the historians or the philosophers or whoever actually hire the person. I mean, in a way, that's the way a university works, of course. And, and that could work at, a, at, a, at, at the law school level as well. And then I, I, I gather the, the, the challenge with that dynamic, certainly as it exists today, is that you may have, let's say you have three people that teach basket weaving law and you need a fourth mm -hmm. person, they're likely to hire like their friend or their co-author, or at least there's a, there's a tendency, I think, at schools where there's a lot of deference to the subject matter experts. If you can't question within the subject matter, you might end up with people replicating the views of the pre-existing people, even if the people that you happen to have on a faculty are, are representing one part of the field and not other parts, or, or maybe even a quirky part. Is, is there any way of overcoming that, or is that just inevitable? There's, there has to be deference to even have any idea as to who's, who's yeah, Well, you know, I mean, that. that's, a, that's a risk. I mean, uh, you know, the university faces the same problem. You know, universities give a lot of autonomy to different departments. And then over time, the department gets bad and the provost or the president realize it's because they've been hiring their friends and they reorganize it. Um, and in the meantime, you know, they do try to exercise some independent judgment when that department proposes somebody and, you know, on and on. 
law schools are smaller, obviously, than the university. And so people will know more what others are doing and their reputations. And if you've got a good dean, that person also will, um, will uh, exercise some, um, some independent judgment. Uh, you know, these are, these are risks. There's always the risk, you know, that people will hire friends or people they like rather than uh, the best teachers. I, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure the specialization problem is, is you know, necessarily a part of that. Uh, one, one issue that came up in, in our in episode one, the discussion with Akhil Amar was uh, a need to hire uh, Professor Amar's perceived need mm -hmm. to hire people who are kind of legal internalists who can speak the language of the law from the in a way that speaks to the legal community. And I gather there's tension between that view and the idea that specialization matters and we just need to be more sophisticated. And in, in each of these fields, we're kind of on a trend towards greater sophistication, which I gather is going to require more PhDs and sort of more more people that are more sophisticated about about uh, uh, the sort of branches of the world in which they're in. Do, do you have a take on on this? Is it is Professor Amar wrong that we need members of a faculty who are legal internalists who can speak to the legal community or or is a mix the right approach? Do you have any take on that from a hiring standpoint? Yeah, you know, I think there are different things going on here. So by legal internalist, I, you, you do mean somebody who's had a lot of practical experience? Is that what you mean? Or, or that somebody who, you know, what writes, who's, who's going to write, you know, treatises and things that lawyers will actually use? Um, so I think more, more the former, but not so much experience okay. as just speaking in a language that legal actors, judges are, are, are going to you know, understand. Doctrinal, yeah, doctrinal or, scholarship. Or, or at least in a way that is going to resonate with legal legal community participants. It may not be their doctrinal in the sense of like, yeah. this is the correct holding, but they're at least speaking the language that lawyers kind of say, oh, yeah, I get that language. Yeah, well, so there are a bunch of things going on here. So, so first of all, I think it's, you know, I, there are plenty of examples of, of, peop, of law professors who don't have very much legal experience who write for the legal community. Sometimes they both do very sophisticated legal research and then they kind of translate their legal research into, um, you know, the style that lawyers and judges benefit from. There are lots of people like that. I don't think there's any real barrier uh, to, to, doing, to doing that. That may or may not be a good thing. I, I think it is probably a good thing, generally speaking. The, the person who does both is, is, is a good type of Person to have on a on a, on a faculty. Um, the uh, there's uh, my sense is that you know people who practiced for a number of years are not necessarily better legal scholars. You know they might be, but but legal practice and legal scholarship they're just different things basically. If you've done a lot of legal practice, you may know, you know, know what's going on, but even if you haven't, you can figure that out by talking to lawyers and reading the things that lawyers. Uh, right and and so forth. I think legal practice, that is a legal experience, is extremely important for teaching. Um, I think uh, people, you know, I, I think that the, the sort of the pure academic type probably, you know, doesn't as a as a generalization probably they don't teach that well. Um, but um, so I, I do think, and there's of course a tension because on the faculty you want both good teachers and good scholars and legal practice, I think, supports the first, but not the second. Or why, why just, just to push, to make sure I understand, why, why do you think those that are either more PhD oriented, why would they be less skilled teachers? What's the they, Because, you know, what the, the real problem with teaching in law school is uh, people have understood this for a long time, that what it means to be educated as a lawyer is less, you know, knowing the rules or even knowing some underlying theory that explains the rules, whether it's economic theory or, you know, history or something like that. Really um, being inculcated with a, a type of almost linguistic ability. You can imagine, let's say, someone who teaches French who's never actually spoken French. You know, like that person has memorized the rules of French grammar, has memorized, you know, pronunciation and 
and um, the meanings of French words. And so teaches French to students by telling them the rules and the meanings of words. You don't, that person's not going to be a good teacher. The, the person who teaches French well is going to speak French to the students, you know, a mix of French and English and explain what he or she's saying and, and all that stuff. You know, th that's what students need. They need to get experience and reading cases and talking about cases and making the arguments that each side in a case are going to make. And I don't think people, a PhD education in economics or history or philosophy or psychology or any of those things is helpful. Um, but I do think people who've done that a lot as lawyers can do that well. I mean, if they're motivated and conscientious and, and, and so forth. Um, so there are a lot of tensions going on here. I mean, this is true in business school as well. I, you know, you know what to think about business school. I, the business school professors are generally not teaching people how to be, you know, business people. <laughs> they often bring in entrepreneurs and experienced business people to like talk to the students, but the professors don't really teach them much. You know. Um, so, uh, so uh, in law schools, it could be like this as well. I, I think that's a real, a real uh, kind of concern. Um, but to go back to uh, Akhil Omar's point, I, you know, I think you know, um, law professors who, who don't have much legal practice can figure out what the problems are, can understand the cases, can propose reforms. Um, they just don't have a sense of how a case works. They probably can't advise students very well, um, so you know. I, I do think I do think that I do think that's that is a concern. Um, so, um, if you you know, if you are looking for someone who is likely to be you know a really great scholar, and that person has spent a lot of time practicing, you know that person has lost a lot of time to be trained in scholarship. And that, that's a problem. I don't think the fact that the person's been practicing for a bunch of years um, will make up for that. And, and, and um, so when, from a hiring standpoint, this is advice certainly that uh, entry level candidates will get, you know, don't, don't spend too much time in practice, right? Like don't, you can practice for a couple of years, but don't, don't do it for too long because uh, schools will think you're, you're sort of, you're, you're, you're too steeped in, the legal culture to be a good scholar. Uh, and then another path, obviously. Well, let, let me just dive in there. Yeah, great. That's not how I think, you know, of course it's always hard to know what other people are. So when I, when I evaluate a candidate, uh, I just read the person's scholarship. That's it. I don't care about anything else. It's either good or bad. I don't care about how many years the person's been practicing. I guess I'd like one year at least as a clerkship or you know, something, but basically, so if a person's been practicing for 10 years and writes an excellent piece of scholarship, that's, that's fine. It's just that that's very rare. Um, and the reason why it's rare is that you can't write, you know, practicing for 10 years is not, has nothing, almost nothing to do with producing legal scholarship. Um, the type of person who, who produces good legal scholarship at the entry level is typically, you know, a PhD who's probably had a year or two also in fellowships who's been doing nothing basically, but um, absorbing a literature and writing papers and getting them criticized and throwing them out and writing out new papers. You know, that's a, a huge amount of work. And, and, and usually people have to do that first before writing a, a good paper. Um, so that's how I think about it, you know? So someone who's been practicing for 10 years and then gets a PhD or spends, you know, a bunch of years focusing on scholarship, that, that might be fine, right? But, um, but uh, you know, I'm not going to say, well, you've been practicing for too long, so I'm not going to consider you. Great. Helpful clarification. I hope no one else says that also. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you're right. Um, so I wanted to turn it for the last topic to um, other ways that law professors might have a public presence. Uh, and so it, 15 years ago, blogging was the way that a lot of people were communicating outside of the law reviews. Uh, sadly, that seems to have devolved into Twitter, on which I spend way too much uh, of my own time. Um, uh, but, but there are certainly a lot of ways that different law professors can communicate other than through their articles, whether it's op-eds. And, and, and um, do you have thoughts on, on what 
how professors should think about these ways of communicating with the public, whether it's through op-eds or blogs or Twitter or whatever it may be? Like, is that an opportunity for people to share ideas? Is it just a, um, is it risky? Is it, is it um, not something people should try to spend time on? And I think uh, also, I think you're a little bit far away from your microphone. So if you come a little bit closer, it may be, may be able to hear a little bit more. Great. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I've thought about this a lot recently. Um, I guess my view is that um, I thought about this a lot because it now seems like, you know, every law professor wants to have this kind of public presence. And, and I increasingly think this is a serious mistake. Um, it's a serious mistake, especially for junior professors, but it is for senior professors. It is for everybody. You have to remember, you know, doing it, I mean, of course, you, you, I'm assuming that, you know, a person in question wants to be a good academic and is serious about doing research. That's a full-time job and um, uh, requires a huge amount of work, especially at the beginning, uh, to absorb the literature, to absorb the norms, you know, to, you know and, and I think a lot of, especially junior people who are on Twitter or writing blogs or op-eds, you know, they should be, if they've got time to spare, they should be educating themselves. They should be learning, you know, their methodology better or some other methodology or a, a methodology, you know, um, which is actually, I think, what people did more uh, in, the, in, in the old days. Um, if you, it, it does make sense to contribute to the public debate if, if you're drawing on your expertise and you can see out there that people are making arguments that are wrong, you know, that people don't understand something like, uh, something that Donald Trump did. You know, everybody's saying that's illegal and it's not, or everybody's saying that's okay and it's illegal, or you know, a Supreme Court case that everybody's celebrating is in fact, you know, erroneous. If, if you're drawing on your own expertise to say something about that, that that's, a, that's okay, I guess. Um, of course, you know, op-eds, blog posts, and tweets are so, um, are so uh, transitory that you're not really going to make it much of a much of an impact, but um, but that's really not what's going on. People are on Twitter and um, kind of ranting basically, and uh, and reading other people's rants, and it just seems like a complete waste of time. The I I, I know a, a junior professor once said to me uh, that they were on Twitter, but they didn't actually um, send out any tweets. They just consumed other people's tweets. But once they got tenure, then, you know, they'd go wild. And I just thought, you know, like if they have something to say, they could say it now. If they're confident that what they say will contribute to the public debate, nobody's going to deny them tenure. And if they don't feel that way, then they shouldn't start tweeting after um, they've gotten tenure. Uh, so uh, it's a, you know, uh, it, it's not a good way to, for people to spend their time. And, and what do you make of the a counter argument that I've heard in, in response to this con, the very legitimate concern is, at least for some professors, it may be a way of establishing prominence in a field or establishing some sort of, you know, name recognition with students who may be evaluating law review submissions or, or just to the extent that if this is where the conversation is, there may be benefits career wise to being part of that conversation. Does that should that play a role or is just should should. Should people just get off Twitter and focus on their articles? Is that kind of the bottom line? Well, they're wrong. You see, the problem with it, it's, it's, a, it's a classic mistake, right? They don't realize that everybody else is thinking that as well. So if you're starting out and, you know, you think you're going to become, you know, you're going to get name recognition and you're going to get known because you're sending out these really incisive, clever tweets that are going to get the attention of the world. You've forgotten that, you know, a thousand other people are doing exactly the same thing. You know, because various bots are retweeting your tweets, you have this illusion that people are paying attention to you. Bots or maybe your friends. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a fallacy that this is a way. People will think, oh, well, that guy's a, an idiot who sends out these stupid tweets all the time. They're not going to say, oh, this person is an expert in, uh, you know, criminal law or an expert in, um, in uh, you know, cybersecurity or something because of their tweets. You know, <laughs> um, uh, I, I really, you know, there's, there's something, I, I was on Twitter for a couple of years. I, I got a pretty good sense 
I, I know what it's like to get sucked into it, and I know what it's like to send out stupid tweets. And the whole thing is, um, uh, you know, the whole sense that you get the sense that the world is looking at you and waiting for you to pronounce on some important issue, because you know that's how it's set up to give you that illusion that everybody falls for. Uh, but of course, it's again, you know, if everybody has this illusion, everybody's doing it's, it's not working. You know, you're not maybe one or two people. It's like winning the lottery. You know, somebody you know won the lottery. Well, then I can win the lottery. It, it's, it's just like that. So um, yeah, it, it's not a good thing. And, and it would be Twitter also, as people have discussed endlessly, has contributed along with Facebook and other social media to you know the terrible things. You know lots of terrible things, you know, the shaming of people who haven't really done anything wrong, uh, the degeneration of public discourse, the rise of Trump, and the people on Twitter are complicit in that, you know. Sometimes they're complicit in that just because they're using Twitter. Sometimes they're complicit in that because without even realizing it, they're engaging in this kind of mob-like shaming behavior because they're unthinkingly retweeting, you know, some some critical uh, comment about someone. Um, so I, I, I actually find it hard to understand why, why people, I, I don't know, why people do this, uh, unless it's just, you know, an addiction as, as it eventually becomes for many people. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think in particular in right now in the sort of pandemic world, it, it's just, it's, it's replacing in-person conversation, right? Because anybody can be having in-person conversation, like digital versions of conversations at any time. And getting feedback and sort of get you know it, being part of a conversation, um, and you know is it a conversation? It's not. It has nothing to do with it. like you send out these tweets, and you know, uh, hardly anybody reads them, right? You send out these tweets, hardly anybody reads. Like you have ten thousand followers, and you think, oh, ten thousand people are going to hear me say this thing, and in fact, you know, a handful of them do. A handful of them is real people. They for, almost instantly forget what you said anyway. They're thinking about other things. They might retweet your thing because they want you to retweet you know, their tweet. I mean, there's nothing to do with conversation. You know, it, it's, uh, it's uh, I don't know what it is. It is some kind of new cultural practice, but you can ask yourself, you know, when you get sucked into Twitter and afterwards, do you feel elated or do you feel depressed? And uh, I think you feel depressed, you know? You get elated once in a while when you're when when you know a single tweet you sent out gets retweeted by a large number of people and then you think oh my god I'm an important person I'm famous um, but most of the time you know you're being ignored and uh, and so then you feel depressed and insignificant so it's like any drug I guess <laughs> do you think it's worse for professors who who can feel like that's a way of communicating with a community, you know, reaching a community or, you know, uh, lawyers that are reading it or other professors. It, it, is it is it worse for those, you know, people, academics who feel like a public presence is it could be a helpful thing? Is that or is it just it's, it's generically it's bad for, for everyone? It's terrible for professors because. You know, professors are experts. You know, professors so professors say to the world, you know, you know, I'm an expert. I know my field, so you should listen to what I have to say. And uh, and then people say, but you know, you were just saying that you know, in this other tweet, you said the COVID nineteen pandemic was you know invented by the Chinese or you know by the FBI. You must be an idiot. Like so, most people say idiotic things on Twitter because they're they react quickly or they retweet something idiotic. And I, I actually, you know, I, I I do sometimes feel a little sad about this when I was on Twitter. There are lots of people whose opinions I, I you know I respected and who I respected as as people, and then I see them on Twitter and they're ranting like madmen. And I and I think you know like wh why you know why, why was I listening to these people in the first place? That's all to the good, you know. Twitter re re reveals just how mediocre even very famous and successful and smart-seeming people are, and, uh, and that's good. We won't, you know, trust them now. Next next time they they say anything, I think people should be more careful about their reputations. You know, it, it's good. You know, it's it's fine to rant at home to your family or your friends or you know, uh, but to rant publicly while at the same time holding yourself out as 
somebody who's an expert on something and whose opinion other people should trust because not only do you understand some field better than other people, but you're actually presenting you know, your insights in a neutral, impartial way to, to benefit the public. And then, you know, to go off on some kind of rant about, about um, you know, Vladimir Putin or, you know, it, it seems crazy to me. I, I think people damage their reputations no matter how careful they are. And, uh, and I don't think it's good because, uh, because a lot of people who are damaging their reputations I actually have a lot of important things to say that you know we should trust rather than uh, rather than, rather than dismiss. Uh, I think eventually people will catch on and be more careful. I don't know. Maybe there'll be a computer program somebody will come up with which will, you know, allow you to self-censor so that if your if your tweet is particularly idiotic, your 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 your, uh, <laughs> your, your the app will tell you no, don't send this one, right? Um, here's another proposed one to send instead. Uh, you know, somehow people will, will figure this out, but I think right now we're in a kind of a wild west. People don't understand what the technology is doing to them and how they look to other people. Um, uh, but uh, maybe this is a, a kind of a transitional period. But, uh, but I, you know, I, I do want to say that, that um, um, this is, I think, a particular problem for universities. We're, at a, we're in a period of populism where people uh, ordinary people are skeptical about experts. A certain level of skepticism is definitely good, but um, it, it, makes ex it makes it easy for people to, to just dismiss everything an expert says if, if that person is uh, expressing opinions about things they don't uh, understand. Uh, you know, outside of their, as we, to go back to what we were talking about, people are so narrowly specialized that they, uh, that, that when they start talking about things outside of their field, they often say ridiculous things. I think this is also particularly bad with social media because of the lack of an intermediary. Writing op-eds, you know, there's somebody there who will say, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, 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 and traditional popular writing for magazines and, you know, other media where there are editors and that's not nearly as, 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 as much of a problem. But, uh, but I do think social media is is dangerous and, and damaging well eric it's been a whole hour since i've been on twitter i should probably get back to it <laughs> uh, get back <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for appearing on the show it's been terrific i really appreciate it it's my pleasure nice talking to you Arne.